Good day. Welcome to Westchester Talk Radio. I'm John Marino, and we are produced by Shark Creative, made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that's service built by Lipolis Electric. Don't be left in the dark. Get Lipolis by Hightower Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard by White Plains Hospital by Michael Labriola, landscape design and construction of our monk, and by Tompkins Pack Bank. This is the Sports Report, and coming up in a couple of weeks, the November 17th Class of 2021 Westchester Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremonies featuring Harrison football legend Dave Salazzo, Ryan Neck, legendary softball coach Joan Spedafino, also Kent Washington, New Rochelle basketball great, and Lou DeMello, the iconic New York area basketball coach, along with New Rochelle product, the greatest football player in the history of New Rochelle High and Rutgers University and New Jersey, a Super Bowl champion with the Baltimore Ravens, Ray Rice. Ray, great to have you here with us. Met you a couple of years ago at the Hall of Fame when your head coach, Lou DiRienzo, was inducted at that time. What did you feel like? How did you react when you got the call that you would be going to the Hall too? Well, you know, it was a, it was a, Definitely a humbling call, you know. I think in life, you know, you go out there, you you reach, you know, major highs, and then you also go through some lows, and you never know where the chips are going to fall, right? Because when you think about numbers and stats and things like that, you know, I think that those fade over time, but what you really leave as a legacy kind of sticks with you forever. And um, to be honored, you know, in Westchester County, you know, where my whole identity was built, you know, starting from, you know, playing football at seven years old, you know, all the way up to an adult. You know, there's so many life lessons. There's so many great people. You know, there was so much that went into just reaching a healthy mental state in life, you know. But to be honored and recognized for it, you know, it, it just is, is very humbling. It's one of the, you know, greatest accomplishments of my life outside of, you know, you know, winning the Super Bowl, having my family um, is definitely up there with, you know, if not the greatest, it's definitely one of the greatest, you know, humbling achievements I've ever could imagine. Were you born in New Rochelle? Yes, I was. I was born in uh, New Rochelle. And uh, the schools you attended before New Rochelle High, which schools did you go to? Uh, so I'm a product of I went through the whole system. I started pre-K at Barnard. I went on to Trinity Elementary School. Then I went on to Isaac Young Middle School and then went on to Nershaw High School. Mm -hmm. And then you were on the varsity for three years, setting all kinds of records. You had that great turkey bowl game against Iona Prep in 2002. What was that like for you? Well, you know, I think, you know, varsity football, was one of those experiences in ninth grade when I went up, you know, I actually played JV in eighth grade. So I got to see a lot of, you know, my family, my cousin was up there and, you know, I got to play with him in, in ninth grade. And, you know, what coach D was able to teach me during that time, you know, it's kind of weird. Like you say, you're going through a game, but you don't really know how good you are because of, because, because of the way coach D kind of, frames things like he, he makes you feel like the, it's always about the team but he never you know took away from the moment you know so mm -hmm. a, a game where I'm having a big game where I'm being recognized by everyone else because he had the ability to always reel me back in so now when you think about it you know <laughs> I guess I can say it I mean it, it was a it was a pretty good game for me you know, I, I, I remember scoring from all over the place as a temperator, you know, doing these things that, you know, people saying that's special. But to me, it was just like Coach D drew up the play. And that's the same way it kind of worked out in practice, you know. So I was able to get that rep in practice. And, you know, here I am executing the play. But I would just felt like at the time I was just doing my job. Uh, you won that game 53-6, the Turkey Bowl against Iona Prep in 2002. Did you feel like you should have been on the varsity before sophomore year? Well, I was. 
You were on the played, varsity, I, I, but you didn't. I was start. on varsity in ninth grade. I didn't start in ninth grade. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So and you really um, started in ninth grade. Well, I had my cousin and, and some other guys ahead of me, but I definitely felt like I could have, you know, contributed, and which I did later in the year. Like I had my first hundred yard game against White Plains, you know, um, you know, at the end of the year, end of the season, and that kind of that game kind of thrust me forward into my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. Now, the following season, 2003, you won a state title up in Syracuse at the Carrier Dome. You beat Webster Schrader from upstate 32 to 6. During your varsity time, during your varsity career at New Rochelle, you lost only one game. Do you get into that feeling like it's just a habit of winning that we're going to win today and that's it? And you don't know what losing is about? Yeah, I mean, winning... It's something that you don't take for granted. I think that, you know, the more you win, uh, the bigger the target. And that, that's kind of been the epitome of my life, you know, because even you talk about, you know, winning in high school, you know, I didn't, I've always been a part of winning programs and, you know, it, but it's the bigger target after. So, I mean, you know that there's no, such thing as perfection. So you, it's like, you at least drive towards that when you're on a roll like that, you know, you try to keep the streak going and, you know, obviously there's the humbling experiences of, of facing a loss, which, you know, that's something that in life, you know, we all deal with at some point. 2004, you were a senior season at New Rochelle. You had a game in which you set the state record for yards in a single game, 462 yards on 42 carries, October 24th, 2004. Do you feel you achieved perfection in that game? You couldn't have done anything more. Yeah, you know, I feel like, you know, as a team, you kind of look at the individual stats, right? And you say, man, that's a pretty great day. And, and the only thing I could be thankful for is the opportunity to be able to showcase, you know, my talent on that kind of level. Because, you know, obviously you go up to the Carrier Dome. You know, I was actually committed to Syracuse at, at a certain point. So you're definitely just thankful of the opportunity to be able to showcase your talent on that level. Because, you know, in order to, you know, be with the best, you want to show that you have, you know, some things available to without even taking away from the team's goals. Obviously, the goal is to win. But, you know, if you can go out there and showcase – and, you know, you got a team mantra first and put out a bunch of yards and stats. I mean, I think that's a great accomplishment overall. You went to Rutgers University starting in 2005. You became arguably the greatest player in Rutgers history, too. This was a program that was not a winning program until you arrived, until the current head coach who came back to Rutgers now last year. Greg Schiano came back recently to rebuild the Rutgers program, but he built it first with you on hand. Do you feel like you were a major force in making Rutgers, turning Rutgers into the kind of program that it's looked at as today? Yeah, you know, uh, I definitely am very uh, grateful for being, you know, part of that success. You know, one of the humbling moments that I've had, you know, was recently, like last year or, uh, you know, beginning of this season for Rutgers football. And um, Coach Shiano calling me, and telling me, he actually just thanking me for, you know, the years I, you know, put in down there. He didn't want it to, you know, be forgotten that, you know, all the success that's happening over there now, you know, he was kind of just thanking me for, you know, believing in him, believing in, you know, the system and helping putting Rutgers football in a way. So, um, you know, without patting myself, it's just that, that was a very humbling phone call from Coach Chiano because, like I said, you do things, you're not really doing them for acknowledgement. But, you know, when someone says they appreciate you, you know, for what you did, you help, you know, you help put this program where it needs to be. You know, um, it's, 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 it's one of them things that bring you teary-eyed, all that stuff, because I'm not looking for it. You know, I just played the game at some point to be able to provide a living for my family, and a lot of things came with it. So... When genuine people say those things to you, you know, you always take it and it means something. 
Rutgers have their highest national ranking ever when you starred for them in the mid first decade of this century in 2005, 2006, 2007. I remember that legendary Thursday night game where you finally got into the national rankings. I think it was against Kentucky and you were, you starred that night. I was sitting by the TV, make sure I was at the TV for the entire game being a, somebody who roots for New York area teams, obviously, you know, being a, a Rutgers fan because it's a big New York area team. And with you on the team at that time, too, there was always that connection. Do you remember that game? And what do you remember about that game that vaulted you into the national rankings at that time? Well, yeah, I mean, we were facing the Louisville team who, I mean, they were, quite frankly, looking like the greatest show on turf. Right, it was you know, Louisville, and, not Kentucky at that time. Yeah, in the Big East. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, the excitement around that game was 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 crazy. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I remember Coach Shiano, You know, I remember tickets not having enough tickets. I remember them having to bring bleachers in. You know, and I remember the student section. Coach Shiano going to hand out pizzas to them. You know, for being out there in the cold. And man, all I can say is. That was like, that was bigger than any bowl game I played in and everything. That was like a Super Bowl. That was like a, you know, a national championship for us, mm -hmm. you know, because we were no longer, after we beat Louisville, like we were no longer a secret anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, Louisville was undefeated coming into that game. Right? Yeah, Louisville was yeah. probably number three in the nation at that point, you know, but um, all I know is after that game, we were no longer a secret. You know, mm -hmm. I was already having great games and people were, you know, saying, you know, this Rutgers team is coming. But we arrived when we beat Louisville. Mm -hmm. And that was the feeling around the whole tri-state area at that point, that Rutgers is here. It's on the map finally. Ray Rice, Greg Schiano put this team on the map nationally and they were a force to be reckoned with. From there, you vaulted into a couple of bowl games, 2007 you were a finalist for the Maxwell Award given out to the top college football player in the country. It's another of those top player awards, not the Heisman, but in that category also. And you were Big East Offensive Player of the Week three times in 2007. You finished seventh in the Heisman Trophy voting. When you heard that, I was seventh in the Heisman Trophy voting. What did you think at that time? Like I still look at it like, I mean... Just to get a vote for the high school. Just to get a vote, right? So it's like, when you look at that, right, you say, that like seven. I didn't even know I was seven. Like, I'm looking back at it like, well, I guess it all adds up now because, I mean, when I when I think about myself, like, I'm always trying to take the humble approach, but seventh in the Heisman Trophy voting, you know, when you project that on, you know, to my next phase of life, I mean, I guess it's no... Shocker that I, you know, went out there and made three, two, like three Pro Bowls, and went out there and you know, won, had a great team and won a Super Bowl because I think that you know sometimes in life destiny works hand in hand, mm -hmm. and I think the tools that I've gotten as a kid, you know, about hard work and you know not being satisfied, you know, um, Coach D preaching to me, you know, too many pats on the back set you back always kept me in a approach of like, there's always more to do. So I think that, you know, looking back on it, the success started at a young age, um, but the tools I was given, you know, kind of stuck with me forever. Rutgers won its first ever bowl game in the first ever Texas bowl against Kansas state 37 to 10. You were the MVP of that game, January 5th, 2008 at the second International Bowl in Toronto, you ran for a new Rutgers record, 280 yards, four touchdowns. Rutgers beat Ball State 52 to 30, and you had a 90-yard touchdown run in that game, the longest of your career. You were MVP of that game also, too. And then it was time for the NFL draft in 2008. You were drafted in the second round by the Baltimore Ravens. Can I ask you a couple of questions about the draft? Number one, were you disappointed to be picked in the second round, knowing that NFL teams generally don't select running backs in round one? No, I wasn't. I wasn't disappointed. Um, I remember the running back class that I came in with. You know, I was, I was 
think the sixth or seventh running back taken in the second round. So I think I'm, I was just happy to be drafted. I mean, you were just yeah, happy. To yeah, be drafted I was just happy time. to be yep. drafted. Yeah, I was happy to just hear my name called and be able to share that moment with my family. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I left. I left school because I mean, we needed the money. You know, I was no no shocker about that. You know, I, I just remember coming home from my last college game, and you know, I went. And I didn't have a bedroom anymore. So it kind of just dawned on me, like I was living, be living better in college than my family was living at home. And I was able to do something about that. So, so I was just happy to hear my name called and knew that, you know, I was able to give my mom a break, you know, um, from financial struggles and things like that. You know, me being the oldest child, I took on a lot of responsibilities and, you know, um, that was a that was like a breath of fresh air for us. Mm -hmm. That leads to my next question: Did you grow up a Jets or a Giants fan? Uh, believe it or not, I actually grew up a 49ers fan. And, and 49ers I fan, them, and I had to see them in the Super Bowl. So I love their color scheme. And yeah, you played you know, against the 49ers in the Super Bowl too, right? Yeah, yeah. I grew up yeah. a Jerry Rice fan, and uh -huh. you know when Dion was there, Steve Young, and you know I just. It's one of the franchises that you remember that, you know, it was the Cowboys and 49ers growing up. So right, they, at that time, very, yeah. Yeah, and they, the Steelers they, 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 and Packers around here, too, despite the Jets and Giants. Giants were good sometimes. Jets, not really good at all for most of the time. Were you hoping to get drafted by San Francisco then? No, I, I went in Matter there to with, you who picked you? No, I went in there just saying... You know, I wanted to get drafted up. I wanted to get drafted high enough to where I, I received the signing bonus that was worthwhile, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, had you would have slid to like the later rounds, I would have been like, you know, I could have went back to college and broke the NCAA rushing record and got right. drafted higher. So I, I wanted to just make sure I was drafted between the first and second round. I knew that would be life changing in terms of financially. So, um, I was just happy to hear my name called in the second round. Mm -hmm. Ray Rice will be inducted into the Westchester Sports Hall of Fame November 17th over at Glen Island Harbor in New Rochelle, the Glen Island Harbor Club. Ray Rice, you moved on to the NFL, to the Baltimore Ravens. You had a legendary career with the Ravens beginning in 2008 to 2013. Highlights include highlights and awards Super Bowl champion, of course, in 2013, January 2013, a three-time Pro Bowl selection, 2009, 2011, 2012, a two-time second-team All-Pro selection, 09 and 2011. You were the AFC, American Football Conference, rushing touchdowns leader in 2011. And that same season, you led the NFL, National Football League overall in yards from scrimmage, which includes rushing, passing, return yards, et cetera, everything combined, all as one. What was the Super Bowl like for you? What's it like to play in a Super Bowl? You have, and so many players in all the major sports have never played in a championship game, win or lose. Man, I tell you, it's one thing to get there, but I couldn't imagine being on the other side of it. You get all the way that far and lose, it's like, I mean, that would be hard because that environment is, is unlike no other. Like, it's not... It, there's a reason why it's called Super Bowl. Everything about it is is big time. Everything about it is Hollywood, you know, and like half like you gotta prepare so much differently, like half times longer. Like you ain't you ain't got the same 10 minutes. You go in there, you know, do what you gotta do. Like then the lights went out in our game. So it was a totally different experience than even playing in a regular game. It's almost like you're playing, it's almost like you're a side act at a concert, but you're the show, mm -hmm. you know, because they, you know, I heard people say they just go for the halftime show, you know, so we like the side act. So who's going for the game? Who's going for the halftime show? So, I mean, it's a weird, I mean, it was a weird, but surreal, great experience. I think that um, coming out on the winning side of it, made it sweeter you know that there's a those are things that you know there's a lot of guys that played the game but there's not a lot of Super Bowl champs mm -hmm. you know and just to have one 
it, you know, there's Hall of Famers that don't have Super Bowl, Super Bowl. So it's like I, I got the one thing that I know you can go out there, you can say stats and all that stuff, but being part of a Super Bowl team is 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 one of the greatest accomplishments, you know, in professional sports. You have the one thing every player wants, right? Every player in every sport wants to be a Super Bowl champion, right? Yeah, I mean, you get you get you get the ring. You know, I think it's more gratifying getting the ring and knowing that you play with a bunch of Hall of Fame players, right? Mm -hmm. So like to say that I got a ring and I play with, you know, a lot of whole, like um there's going to be guys, there's two guys that I play with that's already in the Hall of Fame. You know, um, and uh, Ed Reed and, and and Ray Lewis. So, and then there's going to be more from that team. So, mm -hmm. it's like you know, that's like you just saying, yeah, I played, but I played and won, and the guys I played with, you know, were, were Hall of Fame players. You even played with Joe Flacco, who's still playing with the Jets, and who knows, maybe next week he'll get a chance to play again with all their quarterback injuries too. Did you party? I think he partied with Jay Z after you guys won. Were you at that party too? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that was the first time I can honestly say um, I'm just thankful that, you know, they even showed up for us, but I got to do something for my sister that I'll never forget. I, I asked, you know, uh, Mrs. Beyonce, could she take a picture for my sister? And I mean, how many times in life you're going to get that close to right. arguably, you know, one of the greatest couples out there and just that amount of greatness walking right past you. Like how many times in life you going to actually say that happened and it happened. And I'm thankful that, you know, Mr. Beyonce was nice enough to, you know, take a picture with my sister and, you know, it's a moment I'll never forget. I got well, Jay-Z doesn't have sister. a Super Bowl ring and you do. Man, listen, Jay-Z is a billionaire. I'm trying to get where he at. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did it feel like when you put that Super Bowl trophy in your hands and you were able to lift it? What did that feel like to you? Like for a hockey player who picks up the Stanley Cup, NBA player picks up the championship trophy. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of, I'm scared to hold that stuff, but I made sure to get a replica one for my house. So <laughs> anybody, that come, anybody that comes downstairs, you will see a Lombardi trophy. It's just not the real one. But uh -huh. if you want to touch it, it looks, it, it's a replica. Right. So, um, you can take a picture like with got, it, right? <laughs> yeah, you can take a picture with it. You can right. live out Do whatever you want. Yep. Lombardi moment. Like, I'm okay with that. And that's why uh -huh. I have a replica because the real right. one, you won't see me. I, I couldn't see myself doing what Brady did, throw it, uh -huh. you know, throwing it. <laughs> right. And tossing it. But he got and you know what hockey replacing. players do with the Stanley Cup? They drink out of it. It bounces around. It's got all kinds of dings in it after over 100 years. And yeah. I think they had to replace the real one a few years back. And I think they may have a new one. They had to transcribe all the signed players' names on the original cup yeah. onto the new one. So that's why, you know, and, and I wonder about that. Like certain players, they put the cup in their hands. You see the way they skate with it. It's yeah. like, watch out. You're pumping it in the well, air. Don't trip. They might as well just give a replica out for the winner. Everybody, yeah. Like, yeah, that, I mean, it'd be a smart thing to do. Right. Don't touch the real thing, but this is what you won. It's yours. You can do whatever you want. Listen, with it, right. If that one. Yeah. Don't make a replica and bring that one out for the ceremony. Then, <laughs> right. And keep the real and one win, back in the Hall mail, of Fame. Right. Where, where it yeah. should be. Where it's going to go back to anyway. So I even and, wonder and how these the real championship trophies travel in all the sports. Do they got to travel from place to place to place? And who knows what happens along the way? Ever since you left the Ravens, what have you been doing? I know you've gotten into a lot of extensive coaching in New Rochelle, giving back to the community, and also down in the area where you played in the Baltimore area, too. Well, yeah, I think the one thing I've always wanted to do was uh, give back, and I'm doing a lot of charitable things. Um, I, start, I, I was coaching high school football alongside, you know, with Coach Lou DiRienzo. Um, I had a chance to you know, build a house in Maryland. So me and we relocated back down here and I'm still doing my charitable things um, as far as, you know, feeding homeless, uh, coaching youth football with my counterpart, Courtney Green. And I'm actually, you know, the commissioner of a Metro North Youth Football and Cheer. And that's based out of New York. Um, we have about eight teams, obviously, Nourishell's in. 
Mount Vernon, Yonkers, you know, mm-hmm. Skill, Poughkeepsie, the Brooklyn Titans, and you know, the Westchester Untouchables. So when you think of all of that stuff, like I said, I'm always gonna be in football. I feel like football is always gonna be a part of me. I just know that giving back to the youth because there are, you know, there are future, which, you know, that's why, you know, I started, you know, working with a nonprofit that me and my partner's in called um, Pipeline of Prosperity. And we're just kind of, you know, be able to be a, you know, be a funnel for these kids and give them the resources that they need, not just to be successful in sports, but to be successful in life. So I have a, my track record now is just to be able to give back, continue to give um, to, you know, to our future, you know, athletes, entrepreneurs, entertainers, I feel like everybody has a future. It's our jobs to help protect them. Mm-hmm. If someone would like to get involved with Pipeline for Prosperity, what can they do? Oh, yeah. I mean, so Pipeline of Prosperity is fairly new. Uh, during COVID, you know, we couldn't do as much programming as we want. So, but going into the new calendar year, we will have some web presence. We will have um, our, you know, social media handle. You'll be able to see where to donate, you know, you and we'll, we'll keep, you know, everyone informed about the events that we're doing, you know, in terms of giving back youth initiatives. And, you know, we will make our presence known, not just in the New York area. I'll be doing a lot of work out here in the Baltimore area. And um, we are looking for partnerships. You know, we will try to, you know, build connections with school districts of the kids that's in our programs and, you know, help them out. You know, we don't, we're, we're, we want to be, you know, a roadmap. You know, there's professionals out there that can handle a lot of things. But one thing I know about kids and being relatable, they go to where they're comfortable. And that's why in school, for me personally, I didn't really go to my guidance counselors a lot. It wasn't that I didn't relate to them or it's just, it wasn't right there for me, you know, exactly when we needed it. So we can't be teachers. We're not gonna be, you know, we could be teachers, but we're not working in the school district. That's why we want that partnership where we want to be able to help the kids when they leave you guys from school. We need to be a direct line to those kids' success because we realize that time off, we learned that with the pandemic. You know, too much time, idle time, a lot of things don't happen in your favor. Mm -hmm. And we like to, you know, borrow some of that time with these kids and these families so that they can have a better chance of understanding you know, they have the resources, but we can, we need to be able to be present and put them in front of them. Any thoughts about coaching in college or the NFL one day? Uh, no, yeah, I think the most enjoyable thing I get to do now is give my life experiences, going to talk to different programs. You know, I've spoken at, you know, the Alabamas of the world, um, Texas, Georgia. I've spoken at a lot of top, you know, power five schools and, I'm more satisfied with doing that part because it's not that the coaching takes up the time. I just feel like there's, there's another message outside of coaching that I could deliver. And I still love the game. I think that's why I can give a powerful message to make you think a little bit more about just the game because I'm mentioning a game, but I feel like the game is easy. Life is hard. So I think there has to be more life teachers, you know, or double the amount of life teachers because we know coaching is a small world. So if all these kids is here in this football, what happens when it's not there? You need more life coaches around them to help the transition, you know, from sports to life. And that's where I'm at now in my life. I just want to continue to keep, you know, pouring my story you know, and helping our next generation understanding that, you know, sports is a great tool for life if you know how to apply the tools that you were taught to life. 
Ray Rice, we thank you for all you do for the community. We know you will continue to do. Congratulations on your selection for the Westchester Sports Hall of Fame. On my end here, I'll be proud and happy to be honored to be with you on that night to enjoy your induction on November 17th at the Glen Island Harbor Club in New Rochelle. All the best to you and yours, and thank you for joining us here on Westchester Talk Radio. We'll see you on November 17th. I appreciate it. Ray Rice, legend, New Rochelle, Rutgers University, the greatest running back and player, both programs of all time. We can, without a doubt, say that. And the Super Bowl champion, 2012 season, January 2013, with the Baltimore Ravens, certainly made his mark in his NFL tenure from 2008 to 2013. I'm John Marino. This is the Sports Report here on Westchester Talk Radio, produced by Shark Creative. Made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built by Lipolis Electric. Don't be left in the dark. Get Lipolis by Hightower Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard. By White Plains Hospital, by Michael Labriola, landscape design and construction of our monk, and by Tompkins Mayor Pack Bank. Now, we have an app. We do have an app now here at Westchester Talk Radio. You can download it. Called Westchester Talk and catch all of our Westchester Talk Radio along with Rockland, Putnam, Duchess, Orange, and Fairfield County Talk Radio programming on our YouTube channel, Shark Creative YouTube.